right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, I am in the tough position of being the first to go today. Um, I am talking, my talk's a little different, I think, than some of the other talks where people are kind of showing off a new package or get telling about the technique. Mine is more about how you use R to sol solve a concrete problem. Use something weird called topic modeling, uh, advanced math to solve a concrete problem that we're looking into at the Federal Reserve where I work. So the, the goal here, uh, my team is called Risk and Surveillance, we're in the Division of Consumer and Community Affairs. So most of the Federal Reserve looks at bank and their balance sheets, you know, all about the too big to fail, and, and then there's the monetary policy, obviously is even the bigger part, but there is a huge part of the Fed that's, that, uh, that sort of looks into, um, uh, in my division we look at consumer products, so mortgages, home loans, student loans, and we want to, a way of identifying emerging risks, however we de define risk. Uh, I'm gonna start the timer so I know where I am. Um, uh, so one, we, we have market data, we have data from our examination team, but we also have uh, consumer complaints. And that is a good um, sort of real-time way to understand where, what people are saying and thinking about their experience with consumer products. Um, so. The Federal Reserve has about 20,000 complaints, but the, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or the CFPB, has over a m million complaints. And through our data sharing agreement, we have access to the unredacted um, narrative text of these complaints. And so that, that, that's a good source of information. It's just there are some challenges to that. So that when the CFPB was created and stood up in 2011, oh, sorry, I'm gonna, I just want to put a few caveats in here about um, the complaints themselves as uh, a data source. So one, we know they're not a representative sample. It takes some effort to actually go and uh, make a complaint. So it, it, this isn't a representative sample of all the consumers, but it does indicate people who are having a problem. So complaints also vary in their salience. Having a, a problem with someone on customer service on the telephone when you have a late fee that you don't like on your credit card is very different than having your mortgage foreclosed on when you're in the process of working things out with your bank. Those things happen, the, those are just counted as the same complaints and then that's more of a qualitative measure that's a little hard to, to do. Also, and the banks always want us to, to caveat this and other financial services companies, just because someone complains about something doesn't necessarily mean the bank did anything wrong. Overdraft fees, everyone hates overdraft fees, it's always the biggest complaint. Um, unfortunately, they're, the rules allow banks to charge overdraft fees as long as they follow the rules and regulations that, that we have around those. And so in our risk analysis, we assess meaningful trends. We're not trying to verify every single complaint as well. And these complaints are only a, one component of an overall risk assessment of the market in general. So when the CFPB first started, you know, they had to start, find a process for intaking all of this data. And it's a little hard with unstructured data on how to try to to come up with a way of um, classifying these complaints. And so they created a taxonomy, which is what you do. Um, you allow people to identify what they are trying to complain about. Um, it starts with the product. You say you're talking about your mortgage or your student loan. Um, but within your mortgage, you know, you may be complaining about the closing process, but there's just a lot within the, the CFPB's um, data collection process, I'm not necessarily criticizing, I'm just saying there's some limitations to what we have here. So there are about 100,000 credit card complaints, there are 55 issues that you can choose from. That's a lot for people, so around 30 of those have less than 1,000 complaints, um, 15 have less than 500. So you get some categories that are way too broad, like managing your account for your checking account. Uh, promotional offers are one apps aspect of managing your account, but you don't really see that in the way that they, they do this. Uh, there are some duplicate or ambiguous categories, like trouble making payments can both mean I sent my company, uh, my, my mortgage check in and they didn't clear it and I got a late fee versus um, I lost my job and my wife got sick and now I can't afford to make a payment. Um, it's a little hard for both the person who created that category and the person trying to classify what they're what their complaint is about to understand which one to distinct. And so fundamentally, the way consumers talk about financial products may differ from the way that regulators think about those products. 
And, and then the CFPB did realize some of these limitations in uh, 2017 and recategorized all of this, which improved the process going forward, but it makes for some very awkward looking time series uh, graphs when you're looking at it from my perspective. So the solution here was to use the, um, the actual narrative text itself as the data and uh, use a natural language processing uh, approach called uh, topic modeling or latent Dirichlet allocation, which is a, a modeling, a Bayesian model that given k number of topics, we're iteratively assigned words to topics and topics to documents as it updates the information contained in the documents. So the general process, the conceptual process, how many people are familiar with topic modeling? Yeah, it, <laughs> I've given this talk before and at the Fed, I, I have to really tone it down on the technical side. Uh, I gave it where I put in some math in the last one I gave. Now I'm going to put some R code in. It, I'm trying to adapt to my audience here. So the idea is that you have a set of documents, what you call your corpus. The LDA fits uh, its best topics, and you get two distributions. You get a distribution of words into topics, and then for each document, you have a distribution of probabilities for uh, topic assignments. Um, so this is a contemporary example. Imagine you had five years worth of newspaper articles from the Washington Post with no headlines. You create a topic model with three topics. The output could be election, poll, moderate healthcare rules. Topic two, goal, score, team, fans, rules. Topic three, theater, play, drama, fan. So this allows you to identify topics, uh, review articles associated with specific topics and look at trends in the topics over time. However, it doesn't actually replace the headline of an article. So there's a bit in the way I do this, of the actual modeling process and then some manual review. Um, and I told Tommy this is going to be a, a PR for his uh, package text miner. Uh, I just want to give a quick overview of kind of the lay of the land for NLP packages in R, if you're interested. Um, the biggest challenges in topic modeling are one, understanding the quality of the model, and two, selecting the optimal number of to topics, which is K. Uh, your main general NLP packages in R, uh, TM, TidyText, Quantita. UD Pipes is a new one that I haven't really looked into, but it's got some very interesting things. Um, text reuse, which is very good for identifying similarities. Uh, it has a, a local sensitivity hashing that allows you to do it at, at scale a little better. TM is, I just highly advise not to use. It's like the uh, OK Boomer version of top of, of uh, <laughs> NLP. <laughs> like, it was good at the time. Glad we, you made inroads. I, I think David Robinson's here, and he and Julia Silgi uh, wrote the tidy text package. That's the workhorse one that I use. It's good for um, all around understanding a set of documents, putting them into an organized form, visualizing them, and transforming them into things that go into models. And so a lot of these other ones, like text vec is sort of the, um, what is it, word glove or uh, word to vec uh, word embeddings version, you know, that Python has their, their version of this. Snowball C is for word stemming. Text rank is sort of Google's page rank in text mining. Anyway, within topic modeling, that's the more technical specialized thing. There are the two old ones, that have been around for a while are LDA and topic models. I've used LDA before, it's fine. Topic models is a little uh, special snowflake because you also have to re-index everything to zero because our index is at one and it's a little hard to work. You have to understand how to work with lists rather than data frames. It's a little tricky to use. The two that I am still going a little bit back and forth are on our STM, structural topic modeling and text miner, which is the one I use. STM is an interesting one that I I'm happy, that I think people should look into a little more. Uh, the, the reason they call it structural topic modeling is it allows you to incorporate metadata into the topic model. So one thing you have to do when, you, when you're doing topic modeling is have some sort of assumption about how topics are distributed across your corpus. This allows you to say, if I had issues, which is how the CFB categorizes some of these complaints, I can say, um, skew it slightly more toward ones with more issues. The problem for me is I, they have some diagnostics. I've read this paper a few times. There are four diagnostics. I don't understand them that well. I should maybe go back and read it some more, but um, the text miner package has two that I think are pretty more intuitive. One is R squared, which is a measure of goodness of fit. It's 
similar to uh, your traditional regression um, R squared value. Tommy has a paper that kind of explains this. Uh, I take it on faith a little bit with him on this that it's actually going to get published and I can cite it. Um, <laughs> probabilistic coherence is a measure of the quality of the topics. There's also a semantic coherence, which is um, what STM and a lot of the other ones use. I find it a little hard to explain what semantic coherence is. Probabilistic coherence is, is basically saying if you have, what, it uh, looks at the words within that topic and, and sees how well they, they work together as a group. In, uh, in with, uh, how, do, how would I put this? So if we go back to this one and you see topic two is the goal score team fans rules, uh, the probability of goal and minus the probability of score given that goal is in that, that uh, document, that's a measure of probabilistic coherence. So if this were a, a topic of just the sports section, it wouldn't be good because goal and score would likely to be found in other topics within, within that model. It, it's a little hard to explain. I'm not probably great at explaining it, but it is a measure that kind of tells you how, how well your topic model is doing and how, what your, this K measure should be used for. So here's the, the process I go through. Um, I use tidy text for filtering and building the document term matrix. Filter out um, this, this first part is to uh, get the, the basic data frame that has a, a count of words per document and, a, and also a count of the entire. Uh, and then the next step is to get a word frequency count to sort of edit that down. Um, I, in this case, for this specific model, I took um, words that appeared less than 200 times and remove those and join it back to the original one and cast it as a data um, document term matrix. This is the code for, um, this is nice in that you can run multiple topic models with different values of K in parallel. Um, Tommy will never be uh, uh, taken uh, um, to school for not making his function names very obvious that what they do, even if they're very long. So uh, <laughs> TM parallel apply uh, will, and you know, you can specify how many CPUs you have on your, in your machine to speed this up. This is very slow, so if anyone's using this at home, depending on how big your uh, corpus is, can take a long time to run. But it does, and then I use per and ggplot too. So I'm not a computer scientist, so anytime I get something in per to actually work, it's kind of a miracle, so I'm very <laughs> proud of it. Um, so, and then that, that allows me to then look at, at, so which value of K would seem to be the best one. I can pick the topic model that then, when you see the probabilistic coherence, R squared just seems to keep going up on most of these models that I do. But then I take a step back because there are some actual practical business concerns that I have to take into account. I build 10 separate models, one for each of these uh, financial products, but K is limited at most of 40 topics. It's just hard to explain, summarize, and create trend lines for more than that for the, the people that I'm working with. Um, also, topic models do output a distribution of multiple topics. So obviously, if, if you're writing a document, you're not always just writing about one thing. But for um, the purposes of analysis, if, to avoid double counting and highlight actual trends, I just take the, uh, the first most probable uh, topic for each document. And then it does require some manual view to get a better understanding of the topics. So this is the result of, again, for mortgages. A similar trend line, things are going down, but you do get, um, like I see, these top terms are just words. Compared to the previous time series, it's a better measure. And then with some manual review, you can actually get phrases that fill in what those terms mean. Um, so in general, uh, these results are incorporated into a broader risk framework for our team. We, ha we have risk reports that we use to just understand emerging risks in these consumer financial products, even if the Fed itself cannot, doesn't oversee these specific products or these specific institutions. We want a just to know what's going on. That our stakeholders are the division director and even sometimes the board of governors. They want to be aware of what's going on in the marketplace. There are things that we can affect through rulemaking and, and policy like that, but this is more of an art, a just general how to understand what's going on, what, what issues consumers are facing. A lot of the risk metrics that 
that the, that the bank looks at are for bank balance sheets. We're looking at it from the consumer experience. What are um, people, what are areas where people are having trouble with their credit cards or their student loan or their mortgage? Uh, and then I built an R Shiny dashboard that helps users explore this themselves. Um, I'm not allowed to show that because anytime a company name shows up on screen, people freak out. Even though this is all, almost all of this is publicly available information, I did want to say that to start with. The CFPB publishes most of this on the website. The only thing that I get that you don't get is the actual private uh, narratives. So they only, you, you can opt into sharing your complaint publicly. 30% of people do that. Um, they redact out PII, they have a good, um, interesting method for doing that. I, one of my former coworkers actually worked on that because I used to work at the CFPB. Um, but I put it back in the dashboard. So all of this information, you can, you can go in there and make your own dashboards and look at what banks are getting complained about more often than not, but I just am not allowed to really show that. So I do get a few parting thoughts instead. Um, this is just my general advice and takeaways from doing applied data science in the government. I, I haven't worked as a data scientist in the private sector, but uh, First of all, focus on the central problem and research question, not the technique. Everyone, often you're being hired for AI or some uh, deep learning. Um, that use, you know, you have a full toolkit. Use the best tool to fit the problem, not the fanciest one. Um, engage with subject matter experts throughout the process, both from concept form, uh, formation to validation. Uh, there's no use in building a, a cool model that works really well if no one's going to use it. Uh, a lot of what I do is sort of what I would characterize as operations type research. This is more policy analysis now, but at the IRS where I first worked, we would have examination teams and you say, well, why don't we try to do a better job of picking which organizations to audit? And they say, well, I, I'm been doing this 30 years, trust me, I know, like, I'm in tune with, you know, whatever, and, I, and there's intuition, and, and you have to respect that, because they actually do know that, but, and, and you have to work with them, and the validation isn't just technical validation, it's, does this have a useful impact on what I'm doing and make my job uh, easier? And one way to do this is to find low-hanging fruit, fruit to demonstrate value. A lot of times, people, there's data available, and no one's ever looked at it. You can do a quick visualization and say, hey, here's what you thought was going on, here's what's actually going on, maybe we should do something about that. Uh, my big one that I always that I tell people who haven't worked in, a lot in data science, uh, in applied data science, especially in the government, is that change management is far harder than any data science, te science technique. Um, you can build a great TensorFlow model, but uh, getting people, again, to get on board with uh, that evidence that you showed, uh, I both agree with and can that will now change the way I do my work, almost never happens. Like, the, the best model I saw was at the IRS, I worked on a team that had brought in by the commissioner some outside consultants. They, they were part, officially part of the government, but they had sort of this um, mandate from the commissioner, and then that allowed them to get all of the stakeholders, the high-level people that we can often not reach, onto these calls every two weeks. And it would just be, hey, here's the problem, here's all the data that shows the problem. And every, we're gonna, in two weeks, we're gonna look into it a little bit more. We'll even run some experiments. Uh, this was on an identity theft problem, which is, was a big problem at the IRS, has been improved. But, um, so you get these updates every two weeks. You get, allow everyone who has an actual stake in what's going on to have input into the process. And then if you, six months down the line, you say, well, now we have to retrain all of our call service representatives. Everyone's like, well, of course we do. Whereas if you do all that analysis yourself and then drop that on someone, they're just gonna roll their eyes and, and move on. So, um, and sometimes, like I was saying, sometimes business considerations override override the optimal technical solution, and that's okay. Getting 80% of the way there is, uh, and making allies and getting work in the future and, and proving that y you have some value to add is better than the 100% solution that never gets implemented. So I don't know if this is um, just in the government. I think it's not. 
And finally, communication, visualization, and storytelling is crucial. This is my plug for uh, liberal arts education still. <laughs> I have a liberal arts education. I don't think everyone has to be like me. I just think between that and the social science background, like framing a question properly, but then also being able to communicate both with visualizations, but also writing clearly and effectively is as important as the technical skills, which can be learned a little easier than some of these softer skills. And the higher you go up, the, the more important the soft skills are. So that's my, um, the Twitter is personal account, GitHub, I have hardly anything on there because everything is a, a enterprise stuff that can't be shared. So I do have an example of what I walked through here uh, on a, a known data set, and this is kind of what Tommy and I are like when we uh, run into each other at a conference. <laughs> <So> <laughs> All right, thank you.